was one of the most feared places on Earth. A colony of the damned. The final judgment site for tens of thousands of criminals. It was so harsh, it broke the spirit of even the toughest convict. Here was a land of no escape, a hell on earth, a notorious prison colony known to the world as Devil's Island. On the northern coast of South America lies the colony of French Guiana. A quiet backwater, this small French outpost has been nearly forgotten by the rest of the world. Today, it's home to over 100,000 people who, thanks to massive subsidies, have the highest standard of living on the continent. But lurking behind the colorful exteriors, lies a dark past. Until the middle of the 20th century, this country existed mainly as a giant prison. Most people knew it as Devil's Island. From 1852 to 1947, men were sent here in chains. All were condemned to serve harsh sentences. Some faced the ultimate punishment. Over 70,000 convicts were eventually banished to the prison colony of French Guiana. It was really a living hell, especially when you realize that out of 70,000 men, three quarters died here from disease, from hunger, from mistreatment. And one can't deny that some men were sent to the prison camp even though they were innocent. And many of them were savagely beaten, tied to a bench and whipped. I hope that God reserves them a place in heaven. Devil's Island itself was the infamous home of France's most feared political prisoners. But what the world thought was just an island was actually a vast system of cruel prisons spread throughout French Guiana. The largest camp was on the mainland in the prison city of Saint Laurent. This was where the convicts first arrived and where the majority of them served their sentences. Many tried to escape. Some died at sea. Others perished in the savage jungle. Most were caught. And less than 5,000 actually lived to see the day of their release. The once formidable prison is today an abandoned ruin. Its cells deserted. But some of its long gone inmates have become legendary. One of them was Henri Charrière. He was better known by his nickname, the French word for butterfly. Papillon. Society had no intentions of helping me, of bothering to find out if I was worth salvaging. The world had cast me beyond the reach of hope, into a hole like this, where they had only one thing on their minds, to kill me off no matter what. Henri Papillon Chayer. Papillon was convicted of murder in 1932, but he always claimed he was innocent. Determined to escape, he made his first attempt in an open boat, sailing 1,800 miles to Venezuela. But he was ultimately captured by the Venezuelan police and sent back to French Guiana. The prison authorities had little patience for Papillon, 
and he was condemned to two years in solitary confinement. It was a sentence that almost killed him. One of the most remarkable convicts ever sent to the prison colony was René Belbenois. Belbenois had served with distinction in the French army, but after World War I, desperate for cash, he committed a series of small burglaries. He was arrested at age 22 and sentenced to eight years of hard labor in French Guiana. Any other civilized nation would have given us a chance to remake our lives instead of sending us to death. Some of us committed the first felony in an excess of folly, and we are in no sense criminals. Now we are locked up like animals in close quarters with assassins and thieves. We are men who have energy and self-respect, and the confinement goes hard with our temperament. René Belbenois. Just weeks after he arrived, Belbenois attempted his first escape, but he was ultimately caught in Dutch Guiana and returned to the French authorities. Captured escapees often spent six months in the much-feared blockhouse as they awaited trial before a special maritime tribunal. The blockhouse was a place of exceptional cruelty. Each night, the prisoners' legs would be shackled to a long iron rod. Scratched on the walls, graffiti still counts off the endless days of waiting. Some of the men were walking skeletons. Breathing the hot, tainted air makes them anemic. They suffer from cholera, hookworm, and malaria. Many of them will be dead when the day of their trial arrives. René Belbenois. But despite his confinement, the daring Belbenois was soon planning his next escape. How did such a diabolical place come to be? Ironically, early in its history, French Guiana held promise. It's thought that Christopher Columbus noticed the coastline on one of his voyages to the New World. But it wasn't until the early 17th century that the region was first claimed by French explorers. Soon there were rumors of a giant city in the interior made of gold called El Dorado. In 1763, an official call went out to find settlers for this supposed paradise. Entire French villages emptied of their inhabitants as they departed for a new life across the Atlantic. But catastrophe quickly struck the ill-prepared colonists. Tropical diseases began to decimate the population. Within the first year, over 12,000 settlers had died. Those who survived fled to three offshore islands. They dubbed it the Islands of Salvation because the death rate dropped very, very quickly. They were able to find a way back to Europe, and after they came back to Europe, it was co confirmed that this was not the land of El Dorado, but this was the land of pestilence, and this was a land of disease. This was a colony of the damned. Over the next 80 years, others would try to settle this inhospitable country, but all efforts failed. In 1852, Emperor Louis Napoleon III devised a plan to settle French Guiana and at the same time combat a severe crime problem at home. His idea was to send Francis criminals to the distant South American possession. Regulations were established for this new prison colony, including the concept of doublage. 
Dublage required a convict who had finished serving his sentence to remain in French Guiana for an equal period of time. The first convicts were sent in 1852, and it wasn't long before female convicts were sent as well. Over a thousand women were transported to the prison camp. They were watched over by the nuns of St. Joseph Convent of Saint Laurent, learned to keep house, learned to sew. The convict who wanted to marry and received permission from the penitentiary administration would go to look for a wife at the convent. But the plan to encourage convict marriages to populate the colony was doomed from the start. The main reason that women were sent to the prison colony was because they were condemned for infanticide, killing their own babies. It seems like a paradox because they were sent to Guyana to bear children. The government scheme to populate French Guiana with the offspring of convicts was failing. They began to think that if you married female convicts to male convicts, the children could only turn out to be damaged. So the authorities stopped worrying about colonization. They now worried only about emptying France of its convicts and installing them in Guyana. The authorities ended the transport of women in 1903. But by then, this ill-conceived plan to rid France of criminals and use them to populate one of her colonies had turned into a folly of monumental proportions. And it would take almost a half century for it to be stopped. French justice was harsh and often pitiless. A convict's journey through the depths of hell began the day he was sentenced to servitude in Guyana. Prisoners from jails all over France were transferred to the town of Saint Martin on the northern French coast. Twice a year, a column of condemned souls would march from Saint Martin's prison to the pier. Specially trained Senegalese troops in combat uniforms and with fixed bayonets guarded the convicts as they walked through the town. Since these were men with little to lose, French authorities feared a mass insurrection. Most went peacefully, others did not. The column moved slowly forward Policemen held back the curious who had gathered to watch our departure. I looked up, and there was my wife, Nanette. I never saw her again. Neither prisoners, guards, nor public broke in on this poignant moment. Everyone understood that these men were leaving a normal life behind. Whatever. Henri Papillon Chayer. The prisoners clambered aboard a transatlantic steamer called the Martinier. Like cattle, the men were forced into the hull of the ship. Once inside the holding cells, only a few hammocks were issued. Those without were forced to sleep on the steel floor, which was often covered in human excrement. There was always a tremendous fear by the prison guards that there would be an insurrection aboard the ship. Anytime an insurrection was about to foment, guards opened up steam hoses inside the cages, and that quieted the prisoners down very, very quickly. For half an hour each day, the prisoners were allowed out of their cages for fresh air. They had been stripped of all personal possessions and wore only prison uniforms. But they did have a secret way to hide valuables.
Money and jewels were kept in small hollow tubes called plans. This is the famous plan. The metal tube opened up in the middle. Everything valuable that the prisoner owned was inside there. They could even keep small tools to saw metal bars with. And in order to hide it, they would use the plan like a suppository, pushing it up into their lower intestine. Without having a place to keep one's valuables, it would either be confiscated by the prison guards or else it would be stolen by the other prisoners. And prisoners would sometimes be murdered for the contents of their plans. After a journey of 20 torturous days across the Atlantic, the convict ship arrived at the mouth of the Moroni River, entrance point to the prison colony of French Guiana. We steamed slowly along the bank toward Saint Laurent. We all flocked to the portholes of the cage. There were exclamations of many kinds. Look, look over there, monkeys. Look, a parrot flying. As I gazed out at the green jungle, its immensity frightened me, for I knew through it I'd have to take my chance to escape. René Belbenois. The Martiniere pulled into the dock at Saint Laurent. Many of the town's residents were there to get a glimpse of the new arrivals. It was the only amusement in this bizarre town on the edge of the rainforest. After the material cargo had been removed from the ship, the human cargo of convicts was marched toward the prison. In French slang, it was known as Le Bonnier. There was a huge gate. Over the opening, I read in large letters, Camp de la Transportation. It's the bagne, the men behind me murmured in a voice that was robbed of all hope. So this is where I live until I die. The newly arrived convicts were assembled in the prison's large central courtyard. The commandant of the penitentiary made his traditional welcoming speech. You have been brought to the prison colony of French Guiana, he said, to serve sentences for crimes committed against France. Behave yourselves, and it will be possible to serve your term without suffering unduly. First escape attempt, add two years to your sentence. Second attempt, add five more. But escape is impossible. There are two constantly watching guardians at this prison, the jungle and the sea. A few days later, our names were entered on the roll. Belbenoit, René, 46635. The figures burned like a brand in my mind. I was the 46,635th condemned man who had arrived in Guyana since 1852. But despite the unimaginable misery and hardship to come, the Bagne could not break Belbenois' spirit. He kept dreaming of what only few men had done before him, escape from Devil's Island. René Belbenois' second escape attempt was not successful either. He and his companions were shipwrecked on the coast of Dutch Guiana, Hungry, desperate, and without any provisions, they killed one of their group and grilled his body parts over an open fire. Belbenois declined to eat the flesh. Local Indians eventually turned the escaped convicts over to the Dutch police. The special military tribunal sentenced Belbenois to the punishment cell. 
this time for half a year. Belbenois's cell was just large enough to fit a wooden bed. At its foot, the so-called Bar of Justice. The city of Saint Laurent, where Belbenois was kept, existed solely as a prison city. Each morning, the convicts would leave the compound and go to work in town. Prisoners kept the streets eerily spotless, the little houses freshly painted. Convict labor helped make Saint Laurent live up to its nickname, Little Paris. They raised animals and farmed, built roads and houses, all different chores. Then, after 17 or 18 hours of work, they returned to the main entrance of the prison and were searched for weapons. At night, they were locked up in barracks that held up to 60 men. The guards rarely ventured into this world. It was a place of alcoholism, rape, violence, and fear. The men were classified by the administration into several categories. Well, the classification of prisoners started out with what the French called transporté. That would be the equivalent of felons. They were sentenced to French Guiana for a determined period of time or for life. A second classification of prisoners were called relégués. Relégués were petty offenders, prisoners who had been sentenced for bicycle theft or stealing food. Such was the case with my father. He was caught red-handed on the highway stealing potatoes and had to pay with the last 15 years of his life spent in the prison camp. A convict sentenced to life in prison does not want to have anything to do with a relégué like my father. A relégué was considered garbage. He's a thief who will die a thief. Once a prisoner finished his sentence, he was considered a libere, a freed person. But in reality, he was only free to live in French Guiana and struggle each day to stay alive. In the capital city of Cayenne, a libere band played for meager tips in a cafe. If you are a citizen of Guyana that owns a small business, you can have, for a modest fee to the penitentiary administration, convicts to work for you. You're not going to hire a libre who will cost you more, who has already done his 10 or 15 years of forced labor and is worn out. The last category of prisoners were the incos, or the incorrigibles. These were men with unbroken wills, men who rebelled against their captors. But once labeled incorrigible, a prisoner was destined to a fate that was very likely to kill him. He would be sent to the much-feared jungle camps. Men accustomed to city life in the temperate zone were put to work chopping down huge trees in the heart of the tropics. Half would quickly break and die. To the administration, the men are things to be disposed of. René Belbenois. Disease would eat away at the prisoners. Malaria, typhus, and yellow fever quickly drain the population. At night, the men were locked in cage-like cells deep in the forest. Here, they were in constant fear of predators, venomous spiders, deadly snakes, poisonous centipedes, 
and vampire bats that sucked the blood of sleeping convicts. Although many tried to escape, very few succeeded. And a recaptured convict might have a fate even worse than the jungle camps. The Islands of Salvation. A cluster of three islands, nine miles off the coast of French Guiana, this was the final home to hundreds of the most hardened prisoners. Royale, the biggest island, housed the island prison's administration and also held over 400 convicts. Here, life was an endless repetition. The bell that strikes at dawn to awaken the sleeping man is the one that strikes at dusk, recalling us to ourselves. The sound of the bell punctuates our routines. We live by its tolling. Another day, no different from any other. This is prison life. Francis Lagrange. Francis Lagrange, who was sentenced to life imprisonment, claimed to be one of the great art forgers and counterfeiters of modern times. Though he was known to be a compulsive liar, one fact is indisputable. He was a talented painter. Following time spent in solitary confinement, Lagrange began to paint religious scenes on the walls of the chapel on Royale. But alone in his cell, he also created a series of vivid images of life in the prison colony. I think it really accurately portrays not only just the physical environment, but the agony of many of the prisoners. Take a look at the prisoner with the double leg irons. There he is in solitary confinement with a stub of a cigarette from his mouth. Or think about the prisoners attached, fighting with knives, probably over a homosexual lover's quarrel. He was telling the world the penal colony was rotten, the penal colony was inhuman. It was a way that the French government had decided to just get rid of people without thinking about the future or the past. Across a narrow strait from Royale is St. Joseph Island. Today, there is nothing but ruins, overgrown by vegetation. But half a century ago, this was home to the reclusion, or solitary confinement cells. Rebellious convicts and captured escapees were sent to this maximum security prison. Damp and moldy cells were only nine feet by 12. The grilled ceiling allowed guards to watch the prisoners from an overhead catwalk. To make their punishment even more cruel, the men were sometimes forced to remain standing for 12 hours a day. If you lifted up your head to look at a guard, you felt like a leopard in a pit being watched by the hunter who had just caught you. It took me months to get used to that awful sensation. The men who planned this place must have been loathsome monsters. Henri Papillon Chaillère. St. Joseph was known as the Island of Silence. The prisoners were absolutely forbidden to talk. Food served once a day in a small bucket supplied only a minimum of nourishment. It was here men came to die a slow death. And yet some, like the legendary Paul Roussank, endured this cruelty for unimaginable periods. But he was brought into the cells on St. Joseph's, and at the end of his first 30 days of imprisonment, he spat on the guards, so they added another 30 days. He threw his bucket on the guards, added another 90 days, insulted the guards, added another 30 days, and he spent 11 years in the solitary confinement cells in St. Joseph's, half of his 11 years in the black pit dark hole cell, which was completely cut off. 
It was just total darkness. His name got as far as the newspapers of France, and Roussac became a symbol for the rebellion of the prisoners sent to the colony. There's a small cemetery on St. Joseph. It was for the unfortunate families of the guards. Children who died of fever. Wives who died in childbirth. But there was no cemetery for the prisoners. When a convict died, the body was rowed out to a point between Royale and St. Joseph Islands and unceremoniously dumped into the sea. Almost instantly, sharks, long accustomed to the taste of human flesh, devoured the corpse. Eventually, the sharks themselves were caught and fed to the prisoners, completing a gruesome food chain. The final island that made up this nightmare prison colony was Devil's Island. It acquired its ominous name when the local Amerindians found it inaccessible because of treacherous currents. That made the island ideal for isolating some of France's most feared political prisoners. Fewer than 50 men were ever imprisoned on Devil's Island. The island is only about 1,200 yards in circumference, and one can almost circle it while smoking a cigarette. It looks like a paradise, all covered with palms. But in reality, it is an island hell where many poor souls suffer eternally in torment. René Belbenois. The most famous prisoner on Devil's Island was Captain Alfred Dreyfus. He was one of the first Jewish officers in the French army. Anti-Semitism in the upper ranks was probably a strong factor in his arrest on charges of treason in 1894. A wave of hysteria swept across France. Dreyfus was vilified in the press, caricatured as a traitorous monster. He was soon tried and convicted of treason, based mainly on the evidence of anonymous documents. He was then publicly humiliated, stripped of his rank, and sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island. Alone on the island, except for a contingent of guards, Dreyfus was kept in a stone hut on the edge of the sea. He thought that he might never return might never see his family again, his wife, his children. He suffered the greatest harm that a military man could suffer. He was accused of, of betraying his country. In the first year and a half of his confinement, Dreyfus was permitted to take walks around the island, to receive books and letters, and to occasionally speak to the guards. But the prison administration became obsessed with irrational fears that Dreyfus might somehow escape. His conditions were changed radically. The solitary confinement cell was built just for him. Outside, a machine gun was mounted for added security. This was an excessive type of punishment. Here is one prisoner alone on an island where escape is virtually impossible, and yet not only is he put in a cell, but he's guarded, shackled, and constantly watched. Here is Madame Dreyfus and her brother-in-law, Mathieu, followed by Emile Zola himself, the only movie ever made of the great French writer. In 1897, spurred on by Dreyfus's wife and family, Emile Zola published his famous article, J'accuse, in which he charged the French military with condemning an innocent man. The case now commanded worldwide attention and caused an enormous uproar. <laughs> 
I think if Dreyfus had been locked up on an island somewhere in France, people's imaginations wouldn't have worked quite the same way. If you are convinced, like Zola, that Dreyfus was innocent, that this innocent person was on Devil's Island, meaning in hell, it would strike your imagination very hard. Confined to his hut, his mail heavily censored, Dreyfus had no knowledge of the storm his case had created. He passed his days solving complex mathematical problems. But the long nights were more difficult. He would write, I was shackled in an unchangeable position to my bed. The shackles, which were very tight, lacerated my ankles. The torture was hardly bearable during those tropical nights. On the northern tip of Devil's Island is a bench made of stone. It is said that in the days before he was confined to his hut, Captain Dreyfus would sit here for hours and stare out in the direction of France. I was invited to visit on the 100th anniversary of my grandfather's arrival on Devil's Island, and I was very moved, of course, to see the places where he had spent so much time, where he had suffered so much, and, and looking at these bars and these walls and thinking that my grandfather had spent so many, many days looking at the same wall, not knowing when he would ever return to his family. So it was difficult, difficult for me to fully realize what went through his mind when he was there. In 1899, a new trial was granted, and after four years on Devil's Island, Dreyfus returned to France. Although he was again convicted by a military jury, the government yielded to international pressure and pardoned him. Dreyfus was reunited with his family. Finally, in 1906, the French High Court of Justice cleared him of all charges. He was reinstated into the army, and in a moving ceremony, Captain Dreyfus received France's highest military award, the Legion of Honor. Thanks to his wife and millions of supporters, Alfred Dreyfus had escaped the horror of Devil's Island. In French Guiana, there was only one thing worse than imprisonment on the islands of salvation. The guillotine. Nicknamed the Merry Widow, the guillotine was assembled often in Saint Laurent. Killing a guard or a civilian was almost always followed by a death sentence. The condemned man's fellow convicts were forced to witness the execution. Prisoner volunteers acted as executioners, and they were often the most despised men in the colony. Henri Clausio was hated by the prisoners. When he walked a condemned man to the guillotine, he mistreated him. Clausio hit him with his fists, swore at him, called him a good-for-nothing. But Clausio met a sad end. He was murdered by some libres. They tied him to a tree where there was a nest of ants and covered him with honey. Then they let him die a slow death burned by the sun and devoured by the ants. To some men, being sent to the prison colony was a fate worse than death. A few survived the ordeal, only to come out broken and irredeemable. <laughs> 
but there were those whose spirits could not be easily broken. For them, the only way ever to be truly free was to escape. More than three quarters of the prisoners in French Guiana would attempt escape. There were only a few ways to do this, all dangerous. Escape through the jungle, almost an impossibility. The convicts become prey to it and perish. Escape by way of Dutch Guiana must have been hunted down and sent back to Saint Laurent. But there is the great and magnificent way of the sea and this is the most dangerous of all. René Belbenois. René Belbenois' third escape attempt in 1934 was finally a success. Traveling by land and sea, he carried with him 13 years' accumulation of journals and sketches about life in the prison colony. Eventually, Belmanois made it to Panama and befriended the natives. The Indians were shocked to find that an escaping prisoner would have all these papers on them, completely useless things to carry around, while if you had a sea turtle, you put that in your back and you'd have enough to eat for three days. But here is a man escaping from the middle of the jungle with 30 pounds of manuscript and original artwork from the penal colony. He was determined to tell the world about Devil's Island. Belbenois' dream seemed finally to be realized when he reached New York in 1936. Two years later, his manuscript entitled Dry Guillotine was published. The French government was deeply embarrassed by Belmanois' story and demanded his extradition. He was forced to flee to Mexico but returned to the U.S. when World War II erupted. In Hollywood, Belmanois became a technical consultant on several movies about Devil's Island, like Passage to Marseille, which starred Humphrey Bogart. The courageous saga of a band of heroic outcasts sworn to come back to fight for the land that had disowned them. Why should we help you escape? I leave that to your conscience. In 1956, Belmanois was granted U.S. citizenship by a special act of Congress. His escape from Devil's Island had led him straight to the American dream. Henri Cherrier claimed to have made eight escape attempts. He finally succeeded in 1944, floating off Devil's Island on a raft made of coconuts. Charrier became a citizen of Venezuela and published his book, Papillon, in 1968. It became an international bestseller, translated into 35 languages. Later, a hit movie appeared, starring Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. But whether Papillon's accounts are true or not remains a matter of debate. La vérité de Papillon. The truth about Papillon, about his book, is that it's a fine piece of work. There is a part of it that really did happen to him. It's been documented. But he embellished the story with the adventures of his cellmates and the convicts he met there. However Charrier came by his story, his prison colony experience led him to become a very wealthy man. On November 22, 1938, the Martiniere left France with 600 convicts. It was the last convoy ever to French Guiana. World War II brought German occupation and misery to France. As the war raged in Europe, U.S. troops entered French Guiana to prevent it from becoming a Nazi beachhead. And though cut off from the world, 
the prison system continued to operate. The French had known for years that the colony was a failure. And after the war, a plan was developed to shut down the prison. By 1947, the last of the convicts was freed. Most returned to France. They had a lot of trouble reintegrating into modern society because these men had acquired habits that were incompatible with the French way of life. Many of them ended up in institutions and asylums. They ended their days being taken care of by society. Paul Roussank, the man who spent 11 years in a dark, solitary cell, could not adjust to freedom. He told people that he no longer felt like himself. In fact, in 1949, he ended his life by throwing himself in the Doubre River. His mind was still in prison. Three hundred ex-convicts chose to stay in French Guiana. They had been away from France for so long that this was now their home. By 1965, less than a hundred of them were still alive. That year, Dr. Roger Pradineau was assigned to the hospital in Saint Laurent. His home movies of the ex-convicts are some of the last remaining images of these condemned souls. The spirit of the old prisoners varied. There were some who were jokesters, and there were others who were raconteurs, telling stories about their lives. But others were much more discreet about themselves and didn't speak much. I remember one man who was always staring into space, and from time to time, he cried, tears running down his face. And you could see that this was someone who had been deeply traumatized, someone who had certainly suffered a lot, but didn't talk about it. French Guiana today looks upward to the heavens for its salvation. Six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, un, feu. The European Space Agency launches Ariane rockets from a site across from the islands of salvation. Luxury cruise ships now make stopovers at Royale. Where there were once grotesque cells of despair, there are now tourists strolling leisurely through the ruins. And a restaurant now caters to customers who can enjoy a picturesque view of Devil's Island. The colony of the damned is now a country looking toward the future. If the bind I knew no longer exists, it most certainly exists elsewhere. The injustices and atrocities I saw are being duplicated at this very moment in prisons everywhere. It is important to understand this because a prison is a prison, whether it is located in Saint Laurent or in Paris on Devil's Island or any place else in the world. <laughs>